I'm going to kick things off by talking about I will exchange can I use the capsule. These are my financial disclosures and we'll be talking about many of these companies and their lenses that they manufacture. The indications for IOL exchange include wrong IOL power, dysphotopsia, or malpositioned IOLs. The types of IOL fixation include capsule support, which I'm going to focus on today, which is optic capture or reverse optic capture, suture fixation, such as iris scleral or lasso fixation, and intrascleral fixation through a Sherioff tunnel, glued IOL, or Yamani or flanged technique. IOL exchange and capsule fixation can be bag to bag, can have optic capture, and this is when the optic is captured behind the anterior capsule opening and the haptics are in the sulcus. Reverse optic capture, this is when the haptics are in the bag and the optic is brought anterior to the anterior capsule. And posterior optic capture, and this is when the haptics are in the sulcus and the optic is captured behind the posterior and anterior capsule. The thing that's most important is that we have our toolbox available. Um, before you start these cases, we want to make sure that you have cohesive and dispersive OVD, you have your iris hooks, your spatulas of choice, your intracameral meiotics so that you can adjust the pupil size and dilation, preservative-free triamcinolone or the equivalent so that you can visualize vitreous because doing a thorough vitrectomy is key to conquering th these cases, especially when there's an open capsule. Having your anterior chamber maintainer available and having the MST micro instrumentation or something similar so that you can grab and stabilize the IOLs and cut the IOLs using the most advanced microsurgical techniques. Now that we have the tools to do our IOL exchange, we want to calculate the IOL exchange power. Now Graham Barrett has this wonderful formula for IOL exchange that you can find on his website and you need to do the biometry after and before to understand how to adjust the IOL power. A shortcut from Gills and Hoffer is when you take the spherical equivalent of the refraction. So that's your missed target. If it was a myopic error, you multiply it by 1.2, and if it was a hyperopic error, you multiply it by 1.5. You then take this amount and you add or subtract it depending on the original implant and the myopic or hyperopic error. Now, one of the most common ways that we use is we try to find out what was the IOL that was implanted originally and were they happy with that IOL power in the setting of dysphotopsia or malfunctioning or malpositioned IOL. If they were happy with it, then you just take the A constant and you adjust the power of the new lens that you're going to put in. But you also have to take into consideration the position that you're putting it in, whether you're putting it in the sulcus or whether you're putting it posterior chamber. Now you need to know your bag to sulcus adjustment. And Warren Hill has this wonderful website where he gives us uh, these uh, nomogram to figure out whether you change the IOL power based on whether you're in the sulcus and the power of the lens. Um, and this is uh, very important to have in your operating room at all times. So let's get into bag-to-bag -bag exchange. So one of the most common reasons that we are exchanging IOLs uh, unfortunately is multifocal dysphotopsia. So even with the best intentions and the perfect candidate, there can be some patients that really do not do well with the glare and halos after surgery, and it's our obligation to help these patients. And so what you're seeing here is viscodissection. You can use a cohesive or a dispersive viscoelastic. Cohesive comes out a lot easier, but what you're noticing is that we're not rotating it initially. We were pulling it anteriorly, and you get a sense for how fibrose the haptics are within the capsule. Uh, next, we're going to go after the other end, and you can use microsurgical forceps right here or a spatula to go underneath and make sure you have viscoelastic above and below um, the IOL to protect the capsule back. Now, that came out very easily because this patient was only four weeks post-op. Let's get into our next patient that was post-LASIK um, and had a multifocal place and had multifocal dysphotopsia. And what we're going to do is, once again, we're going to viscodissect down the optic-haptic junction. We're going to go ahead and, and see how fibrotic the anterior capsule is uh, to the IOL itself. You'll notice with technus lenses, uh, where the capsule gets hung up 
is at the optic haptic junction, whereas with Alcon lenses, it's at the terminal bulb. So here we are rotating. You want to be careful when you rotate because you can affect uh, the zonule. So pulling up rather than rotating is critical. We got one side free. Now we're going to go for the other side. It's really fibrose there. So we don't want to pull. You can try and use counter traction. But what we've decided to do in this case is to actually cut the bulk of that free haptic and the optic out in order to then either keep the haptic that's fibrosed in the bag or try and get it out as you'll see in just a moment. So we're taking our 23 gauge scissors here and we're going to cut and we're not actually holding in the right place or cutting in the right place in this scenario. You can see as we cut we're flexing that zonule and creating zonulopathy. So we're going to grab a little bit closer and try and decrease that amount of that flexion. And so typically you want to grab closer and, and cut a little bit more peripheral so that you don't get that stress on the zonule. Now we're going to put viscoelastic above and below and then we're going to cut with 19 gauge scissors and bisect. Now we could also uh, make a paracentesis 180 degrees away and fold this lens but you need a three millimeter incision in order to do that. So we're going to take this lens out while we're using a spatula to guard as we're doing it. We're going to take this lens out, this other bisected portion using the spatula. And then what's so interesting here is that once you get the bulk of the lens out, sometimes the haptic that's in the bag comes out freely. And so we can grab this and use a spatula for counter traction to make sure we don't hurt the zonule. And you keep visco dissecting down that tunnel um, and we'll go ahead and use a spatula right here for counter traction. By using that counter traction, we're able to get the haptic out just nicely and we pull that out. Now, once you take this out, you have to make sure that the bag is open to the equator if you're planning on putting an IOL and the haptics in the capsule bag. So you have to have careful blunt and visco dissection. You can actually clean the bag and pull out the fibrotic tissue um, and it can you know, leave you with a wonderful uh, clean bag and outcome. Sometimes as you're cleaning the bag, it will stress the zonule. So sometimes it's better to just amputate and move on and get a new lens in the bag. Uh, now this patient had a multifocal, they're post LASIK. We want to put in an IOL that has um, zero aspherosity and a different material uh, that is more friendly because the patient also had some positive dysphotopsia symptoms of um, glare, starburst, that were not just uh, multifocal related. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to place this haptic rather than rotating because we know we have this zonulopathy that we could have caused by some of the manipulations and we'll place this in the capsular bag. Now if you use a dispersive viscoelastic you have to spend more time sitting and taking out the viscoelastic. If you use cohesive it comes out a little bit more easily. You want to be careful during all these cases when you're trying to get an IOL out of the bag so that you uh, don't overfill and cause iris prolapse and other issues throughout the case. In addition, we give some oral um, medication such as Diamox to uh, relieve the intraocular pressure uh, overnight. We want to make sure that we use our myotics to bring the pupil down, check that the eye is normotensive, and the patient um, is safe overnight until we see them the next day. So let's get into some optic capture. So traditional optic capture involves taking the IOL out of the bag um, and putting an, the haptics in the sulcus and the optic behind the anterior capsule. This is a patient that had positive uh, dysphotopsia and multifocal dysphotopsia. The patient was complaining for three years. The patient had an open posterior capsule and was told that she could never have this lens out or else she would go blind. Uh, she was suffering, she couldn't drive at night, she couldn't drive during the day, and she was basically uh, in her house. Um, we decided that we were going to try to get this IOL out and preserve the capsule and give her the least invasive surgery as possible. And you can see here, with careful visco dissection, you can actually get these lenses out. Um, once we do this, we're going to bisect, uh, much like we did on the previous case, and we're going to cut with our 19 gauge scissors. Now we have viscoelastic above and below this IOL um, to create um, a barrier for vitreous prolapse. And the whole time we're making sure that we didn't overfill because we don't want to extend uh, this posterior capsule opening. Now you'll notice that the posterior capsule opening 
is um, on the small side. This also can contribute to some positive dysphotopsia or halo symptoms. However, in this patient's case, she had uh, issues uh, that went well beyond uh, just halo, and we decided to remove the IOL. Now, positive dysphotopsia are light streaks and arcs um, uh, stimulated by temporal light, but they're light. They're not dark shadows. Negative dysphotopsia is a dark shadow. So the patient had a multifocal in addition to having um, uh, positive dysphotopsia. So we're putting in this LI61AO Bauschenlam silicone lens with zero spherical aberration, and we're going to place the haptics and the sulcus and the optic behind the anterior capsule. Now you have to have an anterior capsulotomy size that is five millimeters or less from 4.5 to five millimeters in order to accommodate optic capture. Uh, here, uh, because we don't know if there was any vitreous prolapse, you want to make sure during the case that you're using preservative-free triamcinolone to visualize vitreous and then put in a meiotic. And you'll notice here that every time I come out, I'm filling because I don't want any prolapse of vitreous. So we don't want hypotony in these cases. And then subconjunctival dexamethasone to have a calm, quiet eye the next day. Next, we're going to talk about posterior optic capture. So this is a patient who had a complex cataract surgery, had an open capsule, a sulcus lens, um, and had positive dysphotopsia and was complaining bitterly for the past five years. It was decided to proceed with removal of this sulcus IOL, which is easily rotated out of, out of the uh, sulcus. Um, and then we're going to remove this and put in a new IOL. But what we were thinking during this case is even though there was an anterior capsular tear, and that we don't have an intact a curvilinear capsulotomy. What we do have is a posterior capsule that we can enlarge, and we're going to try and do that with the assistance of the retractor. So here we're just taking out the IOL, protecting so that with the spatula so that those haptics don't hit the cornea, and then we're going to go ahead and remove the last piece, and then we're going to go and put in irrigation and use the retractor to enlarge this posterior capsulotomy opening. Now what you have to have in, in anterior or posterior capsule uh, optic capture is intact zonules. If you don't have intact zonules, you cannot do these optic capture techniques. So this is critical. So we're going to open this to about uh, 5 millimeters or 4.8 millimeters is ideal. Mike Snyder talks about making it ovalized um, in, a, in a certain direction um, to help accommodate putting in uh, the optic posteriorly without stress. We're going to go ahead and put in this same LA61AO Bauschenlam lens. Um, it's a dysphotopsia killer at this point. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and capture this now behind the posterior capsule. So both sides are going to be behind that posterior capsule. So now you have this wonderful stability of the lens. We don't need to use sutures in this case. We're going to put our triamcinolone in to make sure we don't have any vitreous prolapse. Um, we have our intracameral antibiotics going in. Check that the eye is normotensive and Cydel negative. So let's talk about um, anterior or reverse optic capture. Now we use this technique primarily for negative dysphotopsia. And what negative dysphotopsia is, is when you have a dark arc off to the side or a shadow. This typically gets better with time. In 97% of the cases, it goes away, but in 3%, they're persistent at one year. So one of the strategies when you get to the point where you have to do um, a surgical intervention is to do secondary or reverse optic capture. Now this requires that you have um, the, the haptics at 6 and 12, and that you have a capsulotomy capsulotomy opening no more than five millimeters. If it's greater than five millimeters, you simply have to take the lens out and put a lens in the sulcus. If it's 4.5 to five millimeters, you can then use this femtosecond Donenfeld spatula to dissect the anterior capsule off of the optic. You do careful viscodissection, both nasally and temporally, careful not to overfill. Then we're going to take two Sinsky hooks, one to pull the capsule back and one to pull the optic on top of the capsule. Now this is much more amendable when you're using the Acrosoft Alcon platform because the IOLs are very gummy um, and so we're watching that zonule the whole time not to pull too hard 
and to make sure that just the nasal and temporal portion of this optic are on top of the anterior capsule. Now let's say something happens during the case and we have zonulopathy or it keeps popping back in. You're just going to take the IOL out and you're going to put a lens in the sulcus. When we put a lens in the sulcus, we typically will suture it to the iris so it doesn't move over time. Here, uh, you want stabilization every time you come out with irrigation. You bring, put in your myotics, bring the pupil down, and go ahead and check that the eye is normotensive. But every time you come out, you want to fill because we don't want the optic to pop back in. And using a hydrogel sealant, such as Rasure, can help um, ensure that the wounds are not going to be um, leaking after the case. Now the last case we're going to show is primary reverse optic capture. So this is a patient that had negative dysphotopsy on the first eye and they didn't want you to touch that eye. So we had to do something with the second eye because she had severe anisometropia. And so what do you do? Do you do the same thing risking that you'll get negative dysphotopsia, which anecdotally is about 50% chance it'll happen the other eye? Or do we do something different? So what we found is that when we do primary reverse optic capture in the second eye, uh, where we put an IOL with the haptics in the bag and we're popping the optic up on top of the capsule here, we have a 100% success rate of no negative dysphotopsy in the other eye. For reverse optic capture secondarily, it's an approximately a 96% success rate. Um, so here we have the optic anterior to the uh, anterior capsule, so reverse optic capture, and the haptics in the bag. So the algorithm of treating malfunctioning uh, IOLs and using these capsules is for multifocal IOLs, we remove and replace them, and we put in a monofocal. For a positive dysphotopsia, you can use pharmacological therapy like bromonidine or pilocarpine, and then you'll perform an IOL exchange for a different IOL material, and silicone seems to be the best. Colomer is no longer available. And for negative dysphotopsia, we want to try to do reverse or anterior optic capture if the capsulotomy and the IOL type will allow for it. If not, we just remove that IOL and put a sulcus place IOL that is friendly in the sulcus and consider iris suture fixation in those cases so that the IOL doesn't move around. So in summary, IOL fixation algorithm, can you use the capsule? This is the first thing you want to ask yourself because optic capture is such a wonderful thing to use as long as the zonules are intact. Can we use the iris for the sulcus? Um, we can use the iris um, fixation technique, but we want to do that when there's not significant iridogenesis or a post vitrectomized eye because this IOL will wiggle out of position over time in our experience. Can I use the sclera? Sure. If there's no capsule support and they've already been vitrectomized, this is a wonderful way and we're going to learn about this later on in our course.